Let's imagine my group therapy nightmare. But you're running your first group. Perhaps it's one that you just put together and formed by yourself, like my associate Phil has done. Good job, Phil. Or perhaps you're starting at a residential treatment center and you've been thrown into the deep end to run a group. Now, obviously, you've had that semester of group process in grad school. And if you're lucky, maybe that was, what, 10 weeks? And if you're really lucky, you had a professor that actually ran a demonstration group as part of the class. And I hear that most people don't actually have that experience. So now you're starting this job and you're in group and everyone is staring at you. And there's just total silence. Crickets. Tumbleweed. Time goes on, and you start panicking, your hands start sweating, and you start doubting all of the major life decisions you've made that have led up to this point here and now. If I've not put you off doing group therapy altogether, I'll tell you the good news. There is a series of techniques and skills you can learn really quickly and easily and implement into any group to stop this from happening. And it comes from the world of modern group analysis, which is a theory of techniques. And I'm going to share some of them with you in this video. And if you like it, I'll make a few more videos because I got a ton of tricks up my sleeves. Today, I'm going to give you the first skill that I teach when I'm teaching group therapy that is going to help you so much in any group therapy session, whether you're running a process group, a psycho ed group, an art group, or just a group that you have to run as a one off. This is going to be so helpful for you. If we've not met before, my name is Oliver and I'm a marriage and family therapist out here in Los Angeles and I occasionally teach group therapy to students in their clinical psychology master's program. I'm also a CGP, which is a certified group psychotherapist. These are extra letters that you can get at the end of your name from AGPA, the American Group Psychotherapy Association. If you're into group therapy at all, you have to find AGPA. They are wonderful. Join everything and anything that they're doing. It's a wonderful experience filled with incredible people and some awesome training. Before I get into teaching you the first and perhaps most fundamental skills of a process group, let's just get on the same page about what a process group is. If you were to put all of the different groups in the world on a spectrum, it might look something like this. Now, at one end are leaderless or social groups. Like, I don't know, a group that finds each other on meetup.com to, I don't know, go hike with their dogs. Towards the middle, there might be more structured groups, one with a leader. This might have a goal and a structure to it, perhaps learning objectives and rules. So a parenting group might be a really good example of that. Now, at the far end, I'd put process groups because they're a little bit different too. Just for fun, let's talk about where I would put an AA meeting, which is a group, right? It's not got a leader per se, but there is an element of organization to it. But there are no skills being taught, so it's more of a social group. So it's sort of somewhere around that middle area. And this is the reason why I like a good spectrum for well, basically everything, because there's room for flexibility and shades of gray rather than things being black or white or having to fit in a certain box. What makes a process group different and what defines this end of the spectrum is the interpersonal aspect. And what I mean by that is that in a process group, we want to get into what goes on between people in the group, how they relate to each other and how they react to each other. A group that meets up for hiking with their dogs, I mean, sure, people are going to interact, but it's not what the group is for. AA groups, you listen to the speaker and you share, but there's no processing. In fact, you're encouraged not to cross-talk with people. And a psycho-ed group, like a parenting skills group, perhaps there's going to be some processing of reactions, but that's different from really being the function and purpose of the group. So for me, process groups are about relationships and connections and understanding how we interact with other people. In my view, a process group consists of six to eight people who are in general looking to enhance and improve relationships with themselves and other people in order to live a more fulfilling and satisfying life. I would add that one of the main goals of being in a process group is to help members find out what gets in the way of achieving this alone. There's also the element of the therapist who is there in process groups to help the group do this. And at the other end of the spectrum, no therapist. Our goal as a group therapist is to give group members the chance to examine, heal, and work through some of the things that block them from reaching these goals, which we just stated were to enhance and improve relationships with themselves and other people. 
some of the other benefits of a process group are about communication. We learn how to be more effective in communication. It can help you speak more constructively. You learn how to handle conflict and tension with increasing ease. Group members get to learn effective communication and affective communication, speaking about your feelings, speaking about what you want and need and how you feel. I think you learn how to connect with people in a different way. You developed an increasing ability to recognize others as different from yourself and um, explore and tolerate other people having different feelings and desires. It's also a learning to tolerate and maintain relationships when things get tough. And then obviously you gain insight as to how you operate internally and in relation to others. You get new ways of being with other people and insight into how you operate in the world previously. I do secretly hope that I'm selling you on how awesome process groups are. And if so, leave me a comment below and let me know what you want more group therapy videos on. I do have nine other classes that I could deliver on a video format. <laughs> Let's go back to that first group therapy session that you're having and you manage to get six to eight people in a room. Sometimes there's more if you're in a residential treatment center and the group starts. Do we imagine that they will all spontaneously start talking in such a way that they start having profound insights about themselves, realize that the way they've been communicating for their entire lives alienates other people? Or do we imagine suddenly they become unafraid of handling conflict and miraculously start being more direct with other people? No, that's not going to happen. And why won't that happen? Well, if we could do that, they wouldn't have signed up for group therapy in the first place. But also things like anxiety get in the way. But more profoundly, perhaps, we aren't taught ever how to relate and behave in a way that encourages this. We simply don't know the skills. And also we tend to regress a little bit in a group setting. We sort of revert back to a more younger, more primitively driven version of ourselves. So what's going to happen in this group is probably one of three or four things. The group sits awkwardly in silence waiting for you to put on a show. Someone else will start talking and appoint themselves as group therapist. And this could be as subtle as someone saying, why don't we all introduce each other? Someone will just launch into their deepest, most darkest secrets or just start talking about themselves. So what can you do? Here's where I introduce you to the delights of modern group analysis. Modern group analysis is a theory of techniques that can be incorporated into any type of therapy group. It derives from a maturational developmental theory, meaning that what the therapist says is attuned to the relational capacities of the individual and to the group. So we're taking a position of helping group members mature into healthy adults by using our relationship, our sense of self, and using our interventions to mature and evolve the conversation. If you've ever been in supervision with me, this is where I say, you need to be good mommy or good daddy. I'm gonna pause myself there and let's get into this first technique. When I first started reading about this concept, it blew my mind and totally changed the way that I ran groups. Before you get too excited, it's kind of obvious and you kind of know what it is already, but you will start thinking about it in a really different way. It's what we call the frame in individual therapy. And in group therapy, we call it the group agreement or group contract. Side note, I worked with teenagers a lot in my career. And my bonus tip here is don't call it a group contract with teenagers. They are quite opposed to that word contract. <laughs> we make agreements all the time, consciously or not, because it sets up boundaries around how we're going to behave. The agreement when you go to the opera or see a play on Broadway is that you are going to agree to be the audience, which means that you're going to agree to the behaviors of sitting down for 90 minutes, generally remaining quiet and perhaps clapping at the end. Same deal for when you're in a lecture, you're entering into the agreement to behave like a student. So you will do less talking, hopefully listen more and ask questions when you're supposed to. The agreement also keeps the teacher in the role of being the one who shares the information and the actors, the one on the stage under the spotlight delivering their lines. In group therapy, we are going to ask everyone to enter an agreement. And I suggest you do this at the start of your very next group, if you've not heard of this before, your first group, whenever that is, 
and whenever somebody enters the group who's new. Here is why this is so useful. If I break the agreement in some off-Broadway production of Hamlet and stand up and say, I'm terribly sorry, I didn't hear what you said then. Could you go back a few lines? Thanks, that'd be great. I will get marched out of the theater and potentially 5150, right? The difference though in group therapy though is it's not about punishing or enforcing the rules or shaming people or persecuting people. It's an opportunity instead to understand and learn about the group member that broke the rule. So let me tell you what the group agreement is and then we'll come back to this idea of breaking the rules versus punishing or shaming people because it's vital that I make that point clear. Here's what I would do and say at the start of a group to set the agreement up. I'd say something like this. I want us all to agree on some basic rules so that we're all on the same page. I am going to ask you all to come on time, stay for the entire session. I'm going to ask you to please respect confidentiality of members in this group. I'm going to ask that you use a fair share of the time. Most importantly, put your thoughts and feelings into words and not actions. Could I get you all to nod your head if you're okay with this or raise your hands? Depending on your group members, you might want to ask them to contribute their own rules to this. With teenagers who were staying in residential treatment, it was a great way to get them to buy into group therapy more and to empower them a little bit. So you have probably already worked out that inevitably the agreement will get broken by everyone all the time, constantly. And it's fantastic because it's not about abiding by the rules. We can count on the rules being broken and it is awesome. Someone is going to be late. Someone is going to not use their fair share of time. And that's fantastic. And we're going to be on the lookout for it, but not to punish them or to shame them or to kick them out of the group, but as a point to explore and understand what is going on with the client. Hey, Nikki, I noticed you were a little late. What's going on? Not. Nikki, you made an agreement with me to be on time to this group and you broke it and you are a terrible client. What the hell is wrong with you, Nikki? <laughs> that is not what it's for. So maybe you could do this without having an agreement, sure. But because we put the agreement in place and Nikki agreed, we now have Nikki's permission to ask her what's up. So perhaps it was traffic, sure. But perhaps also she is furious with you. Perhaps she is terrified of coming to group this week because Michael had a meltdown last week and yelled and that reminded her of an angry father and brought up all kinds of memories that she's yet to share with the group. We won't know until we ask and now we can ask because she broke one of the agreements. So every breach of the agreement is an opportunity for you to process with the client if you choose and at your discretion. I would absolutely be asking Nikki why she was late if Michael had indeed yelled in the last group, because Michael might really need to hear how his angry outbursts impact people. In another universe, I might not ask Nikki about being late because I might want the group to be the one that brings it up to her. I might want the group to share how hurt and angry they are because she keeps on being late because Nikki might really need to hear that she's a valued member of this group and that when she's late, she's missed. So let's go back to the start and that group that sits in silence. I noticed that we're all sitting in silence and not turning your thoughts and feelings into words. Does anyone have any ideas on what's going on with the group right now and why we're not able to talk about what's going on? Or if there's a group member that hogs the whole group, um, we'll call them James. James, hold on a second. I'm going to interrupt you there and check in with the group. Does anyone have any thoughts or feelings that they want to put into words about what's going on for them? And between you and me, that's because you agreed to turn your thoughts and feelings into words, not actions. And you also agreed to talk about your reactions to other people as you become aware of them. I'm not necessarily going to say that part out loud, but that's what's going on in my head. In other words, I'm saying, hey guys, you said you'd talk and you're not talking what's going on inside of you that you're not turning into words. Someone will speak or not at that point. And then I might say, well, you know, we all made an agreement to talk about our reactions to people. And I'm sure you are all having to reactions to James right now. What's stopping us from sharing that? And FYI, in my experience, whenever a group is silent, they are either angry or afraid. 
So they're either really mad at me for not interrupting James or afraid of James or afraid of me. I, I think of the frame as being those guardrails when you go bowling, you know, the ones that sit in the gutter. They sort of help you nudge the ball back into the lane. And they serve no other purpose other than trying to help people start talking more and guiding them more into the therapeutic work. That is the first technique. It is honestly so simple and so obvious, but a complete game changer. And you can keep coming back to it over and over again. Don't expect people to suddenly miraculously start abiding by the rules, but it does give you permission to start talking about when there's breaches on it. As I said before, I've got nine more lectures on group therapy that I can record and upload if you are interested, but you have to let me know. And the way that you can do that is by leaving a comment, hitting like, sharing this with a friend, subscribing to my channel, letting me know. And in particular, I want to know if this was helpful to you in a group therapy session.